We're all here. Good evening and welcome. I declare this meeting of the Planning Committee for the Port Phillip City Council open and I welcome the members of the public who are here tonight. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalakut Wheelam clan of the Boonwurrung. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. We acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. Council has a local law that determines how this meeting will be conducted. There is a time allotted in tonight's agenda for public question time. There is also an opportunity for members of the public to ask a question or make a comment on a specific item on tonight's agenda. This will be done prior to the committee considering the item. If you wish to ask a question or speak to a report, please complete the blue form that is available at the table just outside the chamber and hand it to a staff member. I encourage you to try and limit your questions and comments to three minutes and to try to avoid repeating any points that have been previously made by other speakers. Please note this committee can only address questions and deal with items within its delegation, that is planning matters. Please note that all planning committee meetings are now being live streamed. Live streaming and recording allows the community to watch and listen to meetings in real time. Please also note that according, accord, in accordance with Council's local law that this meeting cannot be filmed or audio taped unless permission is granted by the Chair. In the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, please follow the instructions of the Chief Warden, which is sitting over there at the table. Councillors, apologies, item one. Do we have any apologies for this evening? Councillor Bond, I propose an apology for Councillor Tim Baxter, who is at home sick today. Have a seconder. Oh, Councillor Simic, all those in favour? Thank you. Apologies accepted unanimously. Minutes of previous meetings. Councillors, the minutes of the Planning Committee meeting held on the 24th of April 2019 have been circulated. There are no questions regarding these minutes. Oh, are there any questions regarding these minutes? If not, can I have a motion to move these minutes? Thank you, Councillor Gross. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Voss, I now put the motion. All those in favour? It's passed unanimously. Declarations of conflict of interest. Does any councillor have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's council meeting? I'll take that as a no, conflicts of interest. Public question time. Do we have... We have no speakers who have requested to speak to public question time. Councillor question time. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers? Councillor Pearl. Can we get an update on one to seven waterfront place, please? Is there any movement from the state government on that application at all? Mr. Ball. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, no, no movement from the state government, but there was a Supreme Court Court of Appeal hearing that occurred yesterday. Um, they were giving leave, yeah, so they were debating as to whether they provide leave to the appellants and wish to take the matter further. So we're waiting on an outcome of that. Councillors, are there any other questions? If, if not, we'll move on to presentation of reports. I will now move to the presentation of reports. Item 6.1, 25 Murchison Street, St Kilda East. We have one, two, about nine speakers here tonight, plus the applicant. I call upon Miss Amy Dash, if you could come on down. It's the table in front of you, and if you just press press the button, yep, have a seat there, press the red button, and state your name and suburb you live in. There we go. Um, my name is Amy Dash. I'm representing the owners at 23 Murchison Street, uh, their adjoining property. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, so I understand that there's obviously a group of objectors here tonight, uh, so a range of topics will be discussed and um, I'm focusing um, primarily on the impacts to 23 Murchison Street. Um, 
So, uh, overall, the proposed addition is out of keeping with the local area and seeks to introduce a built form that is at odds with the existing neighbourhood character and which would be, uh, in our view, more appropriate in a general residential zone rather than the neighbourhood residential zone which this property is within. Despite over 30 objections to the proposal and a consultation meeting, the applicant has made no amendments to the plans to address concerns raised. Given the substantial size of the addition that is proposed on site, uh, it's unclear why the uh, council town planner has recommended that variations to res code side setbacks be accepted. At page 17 of the committee report, Mr Beer asserts that the variation to the side setbacks are minor and will not res result in visual bulk impacts to 23 Murchison Street. And we can test this for the following reasons. The first floor western elevation, which comprises a bedroom, seeks a variation from the standards of 1.47 metres. This uh, added visual bulk will have a negative impact on the amenity of the private open space area for residents at 23 Murchison Street. Presently, there is a small 2.7 metre high carport located along the shared boundary. Uh, it's an innocuous structure and, and has no visual bulk impacts. The applicant has claimed previously that they are improving site conditions for my clients by demolishing this carport. However, we do not believe this is the case. There are no mitigating circumstances or reasons for the reduction in the side setback, except that the applicant desires a large bedroom. I cannot see any reason why the amenity of the residents of 23 Murchison Street should be reduced based on this reason. Res code has standards in place to protect residential amenity and neighbourhood character. And whilst they can be varied if necessary, there is no obvious planning reason why they should be varied in this instance. Therefore, at a minimum, the proposed addition should fully comply with the res code standard. Again, at page 17 of the committee report, it is noted that the proposed addition will not extend significantly past the existing built form at 27 Murchison Street. However, the building would extend substantially past the lower built form of 23 Murchison Street at a significant height and with reduced setbacks. However, no mention is made of this in the planner's assessment and any resulting visual bulk impacts appear to have been disregarded. The built form of 23 Murchison is more characteristic of development in the excuse me, streetscape than that of 27. Um, at page 21 of the committee report, it characterises the area as having large, often bulky dwellings as a justification for the variation in side setbacks and the appropriateness of the substantial bulk and mass of the addition. When undertaking a site inspection of the area, this description does not ring true. Whilst there are large dwellings, and one or two with larger extensions, there are no three-storey dwellings of this bulk and scale. The majority of dwellings in proximity, in proximity to the subject site are modest in size and do not include vast extensions, which are out of context in the local area. Number 23 Murchison Street is a significant heritage place and has an individual citation under the City of Port Phillip Heritage Review on the basis that it was the residence of Albert Jacker Jacker, excuse me, during his time as a mayor of St Kilda. Clearly this property has a significant history and contributes to the rich heritage character of the local area. However, there is no mention in the committee report about the significance of 23 Murchison Street um, and in relation to the proposed addition. I only have a couple more quick points. I'm nearly must be at my three minutes. Um, the topography of the land is such that the proposal will read as having an additional 0.6 to 2 metres height uh, due to the slope of the land as viewed from the private open space of my client's property. Uh, and there's concern that the, the addition would set a precedent in the area which would see an erosion of the heritage and neighbourhood character. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, at the bare minimum, we would uh, request that all res code setbacks and standards are complied with and a reduction in the overall bulk and form. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, Romy Paltoglu.
you could just state your name and suburb. Thank you. Uh, Romney Politiclu, St Kilda East. Thank you. So I live in the property directly adjoining 25 Murchison Street, the Albert Jacker property, and um, we are objecting um, based on the points that Amy has stated for my family. And also um, we wanted to sort of take a step back from the bulk and the form and the, and the, the size of it and, and question is this existing house actually a three-storey dwelling? Because we believe it is not a three-storey dwelling. We believe that the plans that were submitted were highly misleading and inaccurate and construed a story that made the existing dwelling look like a three-storey premises, when in fact um, it's, it's to the contrary in our view. So these were the plans that were submitted in response to the objectors, points made through the process um, after the mediation meeting. And this diagram here of a cross-section of the house looking from the east to the west still is inaccurate. There's a window there that appears with a solid line from it as representing the first floor. The window there is inaccurate. Could you please go to the next slide for a minute? because the, the window is actually this shape. And could you please go to the previous slide? We think that the, the level there is misleading because it looks like a story. I just wanted to reiterate that the only floor level on that level is the little red line. There's a tiny viewing platform that has been called the mezzanine that is one metre in width and two metres, up and less than two metres in its widest part. There is no floor line that goes across there and that window is, is inaccurate. So we find this, this confusing why it's not represented accurately. Um, if we could go to the next slide, thank you. Oh, that's the window I mentioned. This is the area of the mezzanine, the viewing platform, that is one metre in width and less than two metres in width. It takes... Um, it takes an opportunity of the, the, right, the slope of the land to, to nestle itself in the existing roof line so that you can view outside of the windows. When this house was um, advertised and sold, if we could please go to the next slide, this is how that first floor was shown. Can you see the tiny uh, first floor reference on the right-hand side there? That is the ground level. It's 16 square metres odd, something like that. That is the viewing platform. If you could please go to the next slide. That viewing platform is picked up and positioned in the existing house upon two areas that we think are uninhabitable, not livable. They are situated upon a storage area and a tool shop at the very bottom level. The next level up is a laundry and a kitchen pantry and the roof heights do not comply. In that, that workshop storage area, the roof height, because of the cross beams, is 1.91. So we deem that a non-habitable area. If you could please go to the next slide. A habitable room, as per your recommendations, is a room or a, of a dwelling, of a residential building, other than a bathroom, laundry, toilet, pantry, walk-in robe, corridor, stair, etc. as you can see from the definition there. So other than we think that the laundry and the storeroom at the bottom where the tools are stored is not a habitable room. Therefore, we find it quite surprising that this bulk and form of a three-storey dwelling with compliant roof heights over 2.4 metres should be constructed on an existing block that does not have three habitable areas stacked one upon each other in a height. Was that the buzzer? It is now. Um, All right. Um, if you could yeah, come to the conclusion, thank you. Thank you. She, she literally did. Um, <laughs> that's all right. No, thank you very much. Uh, Next speaker, Denise Murphy. Yeah. 
So, Denise, if you could just take your seat and stake your name in suburb. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Denise Murphy and I have lived and paid rates in 27 Murchison Street for 22 years. The architects have misrepresented many aspects of the current plans and have based their arguments for height and floor numbers based on many inaccuracies and purposeful avoidances. I would like to bring to your attention the lack of honesty and accuracy. First picture. Plan 6 of 25 in order to misrepresent the existing second floor, which Romy has spoken about, uh, they have drawn a false thick line representing a wall which does not exist over in the top corner. Plan 11 of 25, the X floor line, the, the line of the existing first floor is imaginary and misrepresented. Window is cut off purposefully and de depicted incorrectly to portray a floor above which does not exist. Photo 2. Plan 14 of 25. The fence line drawn is shown is inaccurate and approximately one metre lower than what they are depicting in, in many of the drawings. Therefore, this is not taken into consideration accurately on all of the shadow drawings. Also, all windows proposed will be completely visible above the fence line. Photo 3. Plan 13 of 25 shows an overall height of 9.2, which in fact is incorrect, as the current natural ground to the proposed parapet is 9.780. In all of the drawings, natural ground level or X ground level has not been drawn accurately and has been purposefully left out of all of the 26 drawings. Omitting this natural ground level on sloping land is a gross misrepresentation. Photo 4, plan 8 of 25. The plan shows car, two car parking spaces on the property along the current driveway. The width of 2.3 for the proposed parking would not allow a person to open a car door when they park and therefore is misrepresented. Also on the plan, the real life distance on the adjoining fence, which is over 50 years old, to the existing building is 1.2, not 1.43. The proposal is, c is to continue at that distance for the new construction. Plan 18 of 25, we believe there will be direct viewing from their top balcony to our son's existing balcony, bedroom and lounge room. On plan 11 of 25, this land is very sloping and falls by three metres towards the back of the property. The architects have drawn a very undulating ground with dotted lines and no measurements. They have misrepresented natural ground level on the rest code by 580 centimetres, over half a metre, in order to try to make their building squeeze in to rest code, but it doesn't. We believe that the plans are purposefully misleading and should be withdrawn, reconsidered and rejected. Thank you, Ms Murphy. Um Next up, we have Chris Drossos. Mr Drossos, if you could just state your name and suburb for the records. Yes, Chris Drossos at East St Kilda 27 Murchison Street, the adjoining property. Uh, I do not believe this three-storey extension should be allowed. Uh, it is uh, due to its obvious encroachment of the rest code and encroachment of the neighbourhood character. Just briefly on the plans as discussed a moment ago, uh, feedback from the planners uh, show that we believe that there should be no exemption to the side and rear setback should be given as this as the site is wide enough to accommodate compliance. These lots are generous in width. The fencing height that is depicted on the plans is inaccurate and compared to what is really on site. Therefore, the accuracy of the shadow plans is called into question. And subsequently, they have not supplied a new shadow plan, even though agreeing that the, this fence height was inaccurate. Uh, photo, uh, do you have C? Ah, there is a very questionable statement by the planner at paragraph 11.17 in which the planner states that, quote, 
the encroachments would not raise any character issues given that large, often bulky dwellings are typical of this area, close quote. In this part of St Kilda East, the dwellings are low scale. They are predominantly single storey houses and where it is two storey house, the size of the second floor is very much modest and small. And as you can see on the drawings, and I'm sure you've all been around, and I know Councillor Baxter was around there. We invited him, so unfortunately tonight he's ill. The large extension is too bulky and out of place. Photo A. Uh, yeah. This shows the res code overlay drawing of, um, as you can see, the blue line is what is represented as a res code setback based on their figures. On investigation, the natural ground level is lower than they are portraying, therefore the red line will be the true res code setback. When applying a true measurement of the heights and setback, this proposal does not comply with res code by quite a lot. S uh, and slide B just is a survey plan showing the, natu the real natural ground level, which is more than half a metre lower than calculated. You need a magnifying glass. The proposal does not comply with the requirements of standard A10, that side and rear setback, due to the third storey. We highly object to this decision to accept a third storey, given that the application should at least be within the provisions of the neighbourhood residential zone. And finally, clause 21.05, if you go to the, um, yeah, uh, specifically in relation to the heritage places of Port Phillip, to conserve and enhance the architectural and cultural her heritage of Port Phillip with its strategy to protect, conserve and enhance all identified significant and contributory places, including buildings, trees and streetscapes. This house proposed construction is between two heritage properties. Number 23 is noted as the home of St Kilda's Mayor Albert Jacker and number 27 has a large heritage tree out the front whose foliage is covering this proposed building alteration. Is this protecting our conserving the heritage streetscape is the question. A minute impact and visual block, the proposal definitely does unreasonably overshadow the secluded private and open spaces of numbers 23 and 27. This must not go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drossus. Councillor Pearl, we'd just like to ask you a quick question. Just if you on your slide A here, what, um, you, you're depicting the red, just to explain the depiction of the red line versus the blue line for me. I said the, the blue line is what they've depicted yep. and our calculations are that the, the natural ground is lower, so therefore the red line should be the true depiction. So it's coming back. So that's your interpretation of res that's, code? Well, yes. So, okay. thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Councillor Gross had a question also. Um, could I just foreshadow that I'm going to be asking uh, the questions of clarification on the ground level of these um, from the applicant? You certainly can. Thank you, Mr. Drossus. Uh, next up, we have Nicholas Drossus. Mr Drossos, if you could just state your name and suburb for the records, thank you. Hi there, my name's Nicholas Drossos and I live at 27 Murchison Street, the adjoining property, East St Kilda. Thank you. As the adjoining neighbour, we will be facing a monstrous extension which is twice the current building size and 2.5 metres plus above the current roof line. This will take away all of our light, as you can see on the handout. There will be a 10 metre by 10 metre high wall just 1.2 metres away from our fence line. On that huge wall, we will be daily facing a metal panel, which is 10 metres long by 2 metres high, which a range of buzzing machines with a range of buzzing machines behind it. This will be approximately three, bed, three metres from my bedroom. It shows no respect for any of the neighbours and no respect for the neighbourhood, which is lined with beautifully historical properties which respect the heritage overlay set by Port Phillip Council. The proposed three-storey extension height and distance from the fence lines are not within the res code parameters. 
The extension will be f further five to eight metres longer than any houses in the street and 10 metres high without the correct res code setbacks. The proposal is extending to the maximum and beyond all the heights and bulk of the buildings in the neighbourhood. While they, while they enjoy a panoramic view of the bay and overlook all the houses, including the Alma Road houses and the neighbours in Murchison, from their open glass windows and two balconies, I will be looking at 10 metre by 10 metre rendered wall with a big metal panel. And this is not a high quality design as outlined by Port Phillips Clause 21.05 of the planning scheme. This building is inappropriate for the area. It is, it is too high at the rear. It is too bulky being built from fence to fence on each side and deep into the block so as to overlook the people behind. But most of all, the design is modernistic and lazy by sticking a huge ugly metal panel along a huge rendered wall in an area where it's supposed to be heritage overlaid and period style. Please reject this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drossos. Uh, next up, we have Jewel Riggle. Hi. Um, I trust you all have uh, the document that I submitted today, or would you like me to hand? Uh, if you have a copy, you could circulate. If you've only got one copy, feel, we'll pass it around. Sorry, I noticed that there was... If you just, just pass them over to Murray, Murray will send them around. Thank you. Um, I am actually going to start at... Point three. Um, you can just state your name hello. and suburb for the record. Uh, my name is Jewel Riggle and my suburb is St Kilda East. Thank you very much. Um, evening. I'm, I'm going to start at point three of this document just to um, respect your three minute rule. My husband will undertake to present the rest. Um, point three of uh, this document that our lawyer has helped us plan uh, relates to what we term as the green corridor which is sort of this garden space that um, exists between all the properties. Um, at Murchison Street adjoining to Alma Road. It allows us to enjoy sort of harmonious living space um, to not be encumbered by intrusive bulky buildings. Um, I'll start at point three now. The applicant seeks to say that the garden area should be exempt from the 30% open space requirement under its present zoning. It does this by saying that it's exempt from the 30% requirement because the site originally comprised two dwellings over two separate titles, which separately would grant an exemption. However, that is not the present structure. The present structure is one large house over the titles. We are of the view that this is an evident contrivance to avoid the intent of planning scheme, yet Contrary to this, when it suits to argue the opposite, the application says it can rely on the slope of the whole land and the height of the whole building to leverage another story. We say they cannot have it both ways. Point four, overlooking. Overlooking is uh, an exceptionally substantial issue for us. We are the property that's on the southern boundary. This property would look directly into our house and all our living areas. The elevated height of 25 Murchison in relation to our property coupled with the rear of the proposed building, will overview into our garden, living room and kitchen space, as well as our children's bedrooms and bathrooms at an extremely substantial height, with large, clear, sheet glass windowed areas. It further directly overlooks our two young girls' bedrooms and bathroom windows and our young son's bedroom windows. There has been no endeavour to provide screening and further, pre-existing tree coverage that was shielding some view has recently been removed by the applicant. The effect is the proposed extension towards our property now increases the building proximity to our rear fence line at a height similar to an elevated rail overpass at three storey height. Previously, the built form paid respect to neighbours and res code with a treed garden setting screening much of the lower level building. Our request of council is that A, it seeks legal advice on the applicant's claim to exclude the current built form of a single dwelling in calculating the site area for minimum garden area. We are of the view that the subject site should not be artificially construed as two sites to avoid minimum areas by contriving the site as two separate allotments, when in fact clearly, when it is in fact clearly occupied and built as one dwelling. We also seek that council seeks of the applicant proper accuracy of data for landfall in assessing a claim for a third story, including topography, contour, and distance to the fence line of our property. Currently, there's been absolutely nothing that um, has related to the effect of this development on our property, despite having requested it several times. 
Um, we also seek that the applicant provide shadow diagrams illustrating how overshadowing from the proposal affects our property. We thank Council and, as with our neighbours, look forward to its full consideration in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Riggle. So uh, we have a question for you. Councillor Brand would like to just ask a question. What did you say that you requested several times? Uh, we requested shadow diagrams. We requested any information that was applicable to how this development may affect our property. We are right on the adjoining fence. It will look into our property in a very significant way. Um, each time we requested it, it's been denied. We, we basically wanted uh, the same treatment that the other properties have had, the shadow diagrams and so forth. The shadow diagrams in the application, uh, from, from what I've seen, show that there's no effect at this time over your property. That is correct. However, what we did request was information to support that assumption. And what was the other, apart from shadow lines, what was the other thing? Accuracy of data for landfall in assessing a claim for a third storey, including topography, contour and distance to the fence line of our property. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is William Riggle. Mr Riggle, if you could just state your name and address for the record. Sure. Um, William Riggle of um, 184 Elmer Road, St Kilda East. So um, I think you have the document in front of you. I'll touch on a few other points. So uh, as my wife told me, with the proprietors of 184 Elmer Road, St Kilda East, we're on the direct southern boundary. Um, the proposed extension faces into the rear living and bedroom areas of our property, including our children's bedrooms, bathrooms and living space. We object to the granting of the permit in its current form and bring to the Council's attention the following issues that are of very substantial importance and effect on us in relation to the development proposal as submitted. Uh, firstly, the proposal introduces to the subject land a large elevated addition to the rear of its property facing the rear living area of our property. It is out of character with the historic overlay and in its proposed built form it is a very large bulk and elevated height. The bulk of the extension is out of character because the scale of the building proposed does not respect the neighbourhood character and amenity, and importantly, the historic overlay. All existing surrounding properties are historic two-storey buildings. That the addition is at the back of the site should not exempt it from the purpose and nature of the overlay. It defies the overlay. The overlay is not just about the streetscape, but about the character and construct of the building. This proposal is visually large and because of its height overbears as well as overviews our property, rear yard and living space. Its proximity to our rear fence line coupled with an already elevated ground level of the subject property accentuates that overbearing scale. Uh, secondly, the zoning requires no more than a two-storey building but the application seeks to avoid that by claiming an additional one metre height and a third storey addition by assuming that an existing mezzanine snile, which you've heard of before, single storey room storage area entitles a third storey. Further, it seeks to avoid the two storey zoning limit by claiming site fall as an entitlement to do so. The lodge plans fail to justify the site fall in any detailed way. So to conclude, our request of council is that it seeks legal advice of the applicant prop, oh, sorry, it seeks legal, legal advice and definition as to whether the existing mezzanine storage room should in substance be considered a, a habitable third storey. And secondly, that it fully considers the bulk height and design in response to neighbourhood character and the historic overlay and the overview to our children's bathrooms and bedrooms as well as, well as our living space and garden. Now, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and look forward to Thank you, Mr Riggle. Our uh, next speaker is Michelle Mate. Ma. M-A-R. Ma, sorry. M-A-R-E. M-A-R-R. Is right. that my writing that's... Yeah, I think it might be... It no, it's, really it's a combination of your writing and my eyesight. Apologies. Um, state your name and suburb for the record. Thank you, Miss Ma. 
Councillors, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to speak tonight. My name is Michelle Maher. I live at number 19 Murchison Street, a little bit further down from number 25. I'm fortunate enough to have lived in Murchison Street for, for 32 years and um, I was one of uh, two instigators back in the 1990s to start the process of preserving uh, the integrity of the street. Previous speakers have talked about the inaccuracy of the plans um, as they are and the depiction of number 25 as a three-storey current home when in fact it's a two-storey home. I want to focus a little bit of, um, on the heritage and the historical nature of Murchison Street. So Murchison Street is a particularly intact streetscape made up of Californian bungalows dating back to the 1920s. Um, in fact, I would say that it is the most intact streetscape in St Kilda East at this very point in time. A lot of the other streets have been um, decimated by development, unfortunately. Um, the housing stock is notable in its cohesion in terms of scale, composition, materials and detailing. The integrity of the housing stock has rightly led to its inclusion in the City of Port Phillip Heritage Overlay. VCAT member Sabonis, when ruling against a three-storey development for 21 Murchison Street back in 2011 stated that Murchison Street is a very intact streetscape which has justifiably been given statutory recognition through its inclusion in the heritage overlay. The houses in Murchison Street are single or one storey. In fact, mainly they're single storey Californian bungalows. There's a handful that are now a one storey. There are no two or three storey homes in the street. People buy into the street cognizant of the restrictions um, that are imposed um, in terms of renovations and additions, and they apply by that. And, uh, currently, there are three homes in the street being renovated as single or one-storey um, homes. Particularly, one home, number 23 Murchison Street, which is next to number 25, is the former home of Albert Jacker, the first Australian to receive uh, uh, a Victoria Cross. Its significance is highlighted by the fact that it has a plaque on the front fence and uh, it, um, it is visited by walking groups who, who walk past and include the site or the home in their visiting program. In terms of the, pr uh, the proposed development, it is a three-storey development uh, which is added to the existing Californian bungalow. Um, it will be a massive contemporary structure uh, the size of which is unprecedented in the street. It will appear as a box tacked on to an intact Californian bungalow and it will detract from the existing home and those homes that surround it. It will be the first, the first three-storey development in our street, remembering most homes a single storey with a handful being one storey. The development will be high on the hill. Um, as such, it will be visible from all angles and it will overlook and overshadow the heritage homes which surround it. It will appear as a particularly jarring and uncharacteristic element in a context of homes of modest proportions. Of most importance is that the development will be visible from the street view and from the western and the southern aspect. Again, I refer back to VCAT member um, Sabonis, who in his judgment against number 21 back in 2011, stated that the heritage significance of this area is, de is derived from the streetscape that is the public realm. 
The proposed development does not comply with the City of Port Phillip planning scheme as it is higher than the sight line of 10 degrees. Thank you, Ms. Mo. If you could come to a conclusion, we're at five minutes. Okay. Um, Murchison Street residents have worked very hard to preserve Murchison Street, and uh, and we don't, and we think that this development will, will set um, a, um, a dangerous and, and irrevocable precedent for the future. So, councillors, I call upon you. Um, as custodians of the City of Port Phillip to make the right decision to ensure that this development does not go ahead and set an irrevocable precedent and pave the way for similar developments in the future. Thank I've you, Ms. Got, you probably can't see this. It is a, uh, it, when I talked about the, the 10 degrees, you may not see it. I'll pass uh, it around. Councillor Brand just has a question for you, if you would... Um, Governor. I perhaps should have asked this question of a previous speaker, but your, but your submission is about the unprecedented nature of this building. What's your take on the height at the back of number 27 Murchison Street? What, how many storeys is that at the back? Um, on um, Elmer Road? Uh, no, Murchison, the, the, the neighbouring property beside 25, but the, f number 27. That would be an additional, it's, it's ground and, and one storey. Oh, sorry. It's so it's an underground basement and then the first, or the ground, and then another storey on top of that. Okay. So effectively, it's, 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 it's ground well, it is, and one storey. And, it, and then the basement underneath. It does appear in the drawings to be substantially taller than the proposed, the uh, proposed addition to this to 23. I'll ask the officers about it. I just wanted to hear. I just wanted to hear your take on it before yeah. I talk, we um, ask the um, officers. Uh, well, again, I would I would say that comprises of um, a ground and a first story, and then and then because of the slope of the land, a lower story. Thank you, Ms. Ma. Uh, next up, we have John Desix. Desch. Sorry. Anthony John Desch, 19 Murchison Street, St Kilda East. Thank Greetings. you very much. I don't think you need the Greetings. microphone, but it's just in front of you. <laughs> Greetings. Being, being one of the older residents in the street, 32 years, hopefully it'll be 34, um, and knowing the previous owner, young Bob, he always built that as a single story. It was never classed as a three story, it was a two story. And the basement, I'm going to keep it short and sweet, the basement is exactly that. He used to keep his tools in there. He used to work there, would have an occasional drink and a chat. It was never a third floor, it was never a livable if you can class that as three stories, you want to come and see my cellar, but you'll all have to duck because nowhere does it do have a, a, a ground cellar, but I couldn't class that as a, uh, a livable, habitable room. Great for storage, good for keeping cold wines. How this ever got proposed as a three-storey dwelling bears belief. Seriously, do yourselves a favour. Get out there and have a look. Look at your lovely streets. Enjoy what your neighbours and your people are doing and trying to do and keep the place as intact as it can. Take pride. We do. That's why we're here tonight. We want to keep it the way it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. We love short and sweet. Uh, and our final speaker is the speaking on behalf of the applicant, Mr Paul Little. If you could come down and welcome back. And thank you very much. To state your name and uh, suburb for the record. Uh, thank you, councillors. My name is Paul Little. I'm a town planning consultant. I operate out of um, the city of Melbourne in the suburb on Collins Street. Um, I'm here tonight to address you in relation to what is a significant application for my client, 
It is their intention to build their family home at 25 Murchison Street. And in doing so, they have very carefully um, and skillfully, in my view, considered how 25 Murchison Street can meet their needs. The application proposes partial demolition of the existing heritage building and rear additions, the additions to the rear in a contemporary form, and it's also proposed to re restore many of the heritage features that um, have been altered from the front of the building um, over the years, including um, the front entry door, which is in fact originally a side entry door. The subject site has um, some particular or particularly interesting um, features. One, it is presently in two lots. There can be no doubt about the fact that the title involves two lots. That bears no um, issue in relation to garden area as it's been put to you. Legally, um, the garden area does not apply, but even if you assess the application on the basis of um, the whole of the land, the permeability for the site exceeds 40 per cent. And um, to that end, we would clearly satisfy any garden area test over the whole of the land. The existing dwelling is factually three storeys. We have very meticulously gone through assessment of the site, including each of the three levels. We've had those levels validated by a licensed surveyor. And at the very outset of our engagement with Council, um, we met with Mr Gutteridge, a very experienced officer here at Council, to discuss the issue and um, work through the sort of information that would be required to satisfy Council officers in relation to that existing form. And that has been accepted from the outset um, and is repeated in the officer's assessment of the proposal. Fundamentally, this application proceeds on the basis of responding to the heritage overlay provisions and the significant grading of the building, which, as you well know, requires the siting of additions into a sight line such that um, this building, uh, as it's proposed, has a marginal breach of something like 237 millimetres above the 10 degree sight line. It's highly compliant and we had very um, favourable uh, referral comments from Council's Heritage Advisor. In relation to um, other matters that have been put to you, in relation to the accuracy of plans, we stand by the levels that have been informed again by a licensed surveyor. They've been carefully considered through the way in which the application's been composed. And whilst we acknowledge there are variations to standard A10 in this instance, what has to be considered is what the effect of those variations is. That's the way Res Code works. It is a discretionary provision, an objective-based provision where standards can be varied, where amenity implications are considered to be reasonable. And that's the position um, we and the council officers have arrived at in this instance. In relation to matters of overshadowing that have been raised again, we um, uh, maintain our view that the proposal um, does not unreasonably overshadow adjoining properties in accordance with the RESCO provisions, and um, partly because of the fact that the site has significant fall of around about 3.6 metres from its um, northeastern corner to its southwestern corner, which is typified by um, the location. I think that covers all the points I wanted to raise other than um, dealing with building height. I suspect I may have some questions um, in relation to that, so I'm ready to address those as they Councillor arise. Gross had his hand up already. Um, Councillor Gross, any questions? Um, I don't know whether you've seen this particular plan, but it um, talks about the RL, and the assertion is that um, there's um, a, that it should um, that the RL should is is actually lower than in the plan, and that and that therefore the um, breach of the massing rules would be slightly more. Could you just talk to me about um, how you would defend and how that was measured? Yeah, certainly. Um, could I ask if it's possible to view the ground floor plan in the first instance, because I want to refer to... That's 16 of 25. Sorry, Just I don't... bear with us while we get that... I think it's 16 of 25. Uh, ...brought to the screen. That's the plan you've referred to, um, Councillor Gross. I'm actually hoping to refer to... Um, in the first instance, a plan slightly beyond there, which is in fact um, TP15. So 
Is that the one you're referring to? That's correct, although it's very difficult to see because of the scale. It is uh, um, very difficult to see. Councillor Gross, I'll, I'll try and explain it verbally and hopefully I can address your question because I've turned my mind to it having heard what's been three between number five and 27 is measured to be, um, sorry, I've just lost my spot there for a moment. In fact, it's easiest to look at this on TP16, Councillor Gross, as you've perhaps correctly put, because that's the, um, that's, the section is, that cuts through the rear section. Which is the next slide edition. down. There we go. So you can see there that um, this is the original submitted plan without the alterations that have been um, made to it. And you can see where the res code profile um, cuts through on the right-hand side of both sections one and two. And what is shown there is an existing natural ground level at the boundary. The boundary is slightly offset here because of the fence position over um, a long period of time. The existing circumstances of the site are that there is a garden bed that rises about 380 millimetres or 38 centimetres, we're talking about something like so, above what I consider to be an excavated level at the back of the site. The level directly adjoining the site at number 27, um, on my observation, uh, I think is marginally higher than the level we show at the subject site. Um, or on the boundary, on our plan. And in order to assess standard A10, um, the view I have is that you have to assess it on the basis of what the impact is. And the impact can only be upon the adjoining property and its respective level. So it's entirely appropriate to take the level of where you measure A10 from, or standard A10 from the title boundary, because that is the closest to most accurate representation of the level at the point where the impact can occur. There is also a proposal, and I think it's worth um, working back to uh, the rear elevation. I'll give you a drawing reference um, of TP14. So it's only two plans earlier, which again is helpful in explaining what's proposed and what the existing conditions are. So you'll see there what that elevation shows is the level difference between the two properties. We've measured the um, the level to be essentially consistent with the subject site. Again, I say that's a conservative measure. You can see the natural ground level running across the back of the site, which is the hatched line. And then it's proposed to further excavate um, to essentially site the lowest level of development here, the ground floor um, below the existing line. So that's further excavation relative to the adjoining boundary. And I'll ask you just to scroll up a little bit on that plan, if I may, because it's relevant um, to one of the points that was raised tonight is that how the proposed building sits relative to um, number 27, which you can see on the right side of the page, which, again, using survey information, we've had those levels measured, and you can see the silhouette of the existing building at number 27 um, clearly higher than what's proposed on number 25 in this instance, by a factor of something like 2.3 metres between what is our flat roof and their pitched roof. Councillors, were there any other questions of the applicant? Sorry, thank you. you be no calling out. Sorry, Councillor Crawford. Sorry. If okay, I can speak. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask a probably um, not so much a technical question. In given that obviously there is um, a feeling from the objectors that it is a big and because the land slopes, it probably appears bigger than perhaps. Has, there, has, your, um, has the owner given any thought to maybe making adjustments, given that they want to live there, to maybe fit into the neighbourhood and just be a bit more amicable? I'm just asking a very, you know, question, because you're going to have to live there. Yes. Um, well, I can't speak directly on behalf of my client in relation to that particular question, but I do know it's their intention to make this their family home. They have one child and are expecting a second child. Um, if you look at that image again on the screen, and I, I guess what we're saying to you is that we need to understand the context of the site in a variety of ways, including the fall of the land. And what you see on the elevation on the screen is in fact the proposal sitting in a mediation point between the two adjoining buildings at number 27 and number 23. In other words, we don't sit higher than um, both dwellings. In fact, it sits around about the middle point between the two buildings. And that is partly 
as a result of the fall of land. It's also partly a result of how the levels have been worked by this scheme to situate the building as low as relatively possible to limit that impact. So to that end, we have had careful regard to all of the provisions of ResCode, which apply in this case, because of the nuance of there being two lots. The Council Officer's report essentially addresses two points, one being the A10 um, setback provisions, which I've addressed already, and we maintain our view that there isn't an unreasonable amenity result deriving from that variation, but also in relation to matters of overlooking at standard A15. And um, the conditions that are being proposed by officers are perfectly reasonable in the context of overlooking from our position. I've got a... Sorry, Councillor Brand, you go ahead. Yes, I just want to take you back to the um, to the to where you've calculated the res code profile from, which is a, an RL of um, 32400. Um, there's two different points where it's measured on the sections. Councillor Brand, you're quite right. 32400. Oh, I see. No, no, I and see. One of them is... All right, one of them is three two, and the other one is three two six zero. Yeah. So those sections are taken around about three metres apart through the rear of the building to okay. depict I, that change. Okay. I was going to change. ask you how, if you go, can you just scroll down a tiny bit? Yeah. Can you tell me where on the, where on that sloping natural ground each of those was taken? Certainly. Just relative how, to how far south or north they would yes. be. Yes, um, Council Brand. If you look at um, the elevation there, you can see the raked wall at the rear of the property that rises mm -hmm. up and you can in fact see where that raking wall um, returns horizontal there's a, a balcony that sits and you can see the profile of a window at that point so that runs through um, essentially the highest relative point of the building mm -hmm. so the first section or section one is taken through that alignment and then so you can see mm -hmm. uh, it runs right through the balcony so on section one you can see the balcony on the right hand side um, of the section and then the bedroom um, beyond it in the distance and then the second section, or section is two, is taken, on my calculation, about three metres behind that point, running, um, in that case, through um, on plan, through um, both the ensuite and bedroom one. OK. Uh, and is there a drawing you can show us that shows the relative position of the next door house in plan form with your house? with your clients. A, a plan. Um, just, to, just to see, I understand where those points are taken, and I'd just like to see where they are relative to the to number 27 footprint. I believe they are. Um, the shadow diagrams are one way to see it, because the building profiles are shown in full form. I'm just trying to see if there's another um, plan to depict it. I think not. So if you go through to, um, say, TP21 um, will be a, a good one to go to, um, what that depicts is the, the location of the subject site, um, both in its existing condition on the left-hand side and in its proposed condition um, on the right-hand side. And you can see the relative position of where the building extends relative to its neighbours. It does go well past um, number 23 um, and aligns essentially with the outbuildings at number 27, although they are on the eastern side of that particular property. The point that you've cut the uh, d taking that ground level at three two six zero. Yes. Uh, that's on the second section. That would be approximately within reasonable distance of the end of the of of yeah. twenty of Cl twenty seven. Um, Council Brown, but slightly south of that alignment, okay. I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question here. In the existing dwelling, we've heard a couple of speakers tonight discuss whether it is two storeys or it is three storeys. Um, what test was used to determine if it is a, a two or three storey building in its existing form? Thank you, Councillor Bond. In relation to um, dealing with the question of height, it became apparent to us on first inspecting the site that the building was three storeys. Firstly, from standing outside and simply seeing the scale of it. Um, uh, on the western side, if you stand adjacent to the lowest level of the development or lowest story of the development, you're looking at a building, as you can see in the elevations, exceeding nine metres. We um, then formed the view that in order to test the verticality of where those points were lying, that we in fact needed a surveyor to inform that. And we had a surveyor come out to do essentially um, two things. One, profile the floor to ceiling clearances, i.e. floor to underside of the ceiling, to demonstrate that it's a compliant level under building code and then also to consider that against um, section diagrams which 
demonstrate very clearly in material we've supplied to Council from the outset that this is in fact a three-storey building. I understand the issue that's been flagged by some of the residents in relation to the extent of the mezzanine. However, it is a mezzanine. And when you go to the definition of what constitutes a story in the Planning Environment Act, it very clearly includes a mezzanine. So whilst I understand um, the submissions that have been put about its size um, and its proportion to the balance of the dwelling, but the fact is it exists. And at that profile, in the survey material we've provided, we've got three levels complying with building code on the subject site. Any other councillors? No. Thank you, Mr Little. And no further speakers. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much. Just wondering if officers could comment. Uh, there's a number of points here, as I'm sure other councillors go through them as well, but the first one, which is a small one for me, uh, was the machinery in terms of uh, air conditioning machinery, etc., and how far away that is from the fence line and what uh, mitigants have been put in place to reduce noise and visual pollution. So through you, Mr Chair, um, the plant and equipment is not shown on the plans. Um, however, there is a condition which is at condition four on page nine of the report, which is a standard condition we use specifically in heritage areas, which requires that um, any well, that any plant and equipment not be visible from a street or public park. Um, so that's our standard requirement for heritage for in, in heritage precincts. Councillor Pill. So is there any assurances that the property next door uh, won't get uh, um, huge amounts of uh, noise pollution and uh Through you, Mr Chair, no, it's, it's not shown on the plan, so under the condition as it's written, as long as it's not visible from the street, we're not controlling where it goes. Um, should you wish, you could include a condition under condition one, um, recommended condition one, which requires amended plans to be submitted, and you could require that screening, uh, that plant and equipment be shown, and that any that would be visible from adjoining properties be screened, which could assist with visibility. Noise is also addressed through other legislation that relates to noise, such as EPA regulations. Thank you. Councillor Pell, just to clarify, was your question in relation to the comment on that diagram about... Yeah, that's correct. There was a comment from one of the speakers that behind that steel um, screen there was going to be machines whizzing. I can't remember exactly what the comment was, but it was something about machines whizzing or devices whizzing. Be oh, he's gone. All right, he's not here anymore. Um, behind that screen. Are you able to speak to what would be behind that screen on the plans and if there's any item there that may cause um, concern to the neighbours with regard to noise? Uh, yes, so if you look at um, Advertised Plan 10, TP10, services are actually indicated there, so I apologise for that. They're, they're not shown specifically what would be there. However, it does say services and that would be behind the screen. So this, in effect, that is what that metal screen would do, is to conceal the services and hide it from view. So I apologise for my first response being slightly inaccurate. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Voss? Yes, thank you. Three, two, um, just address um, a consistent theme through many of the uh, speakers about the inaccurate plans. Um, and I'm just wondering if I could get an understanding from you, uh, Ms Pound, around uh, the claims that perhaps the fence heights were, aren't accurate, the window shape's incorrect, uh, the ground level's not right, the car park size is uh, much short, smaller than it's on the, on the plan and the shadow diagrams are inco incorrect. Um, I'm asking you about your confidence, I suppose, in the plans that we're making a decision on tonight. Um, in, are you confident that they're the, they're the accurate, accurate ones? Ms Pound? Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair, um, 
Um, yes, I am confident that the plans we have are sufficiently accurate, having heard a number of concerns come from residents in the objections, but also in the consultation meeting. Um, we've, as office has gone through a number of exercises to ensure the accuracy that is included undertaking a site inspection in relation to understanding the stories that are there on the site and to ensure that the survey in information we've been provided is accurate with what we've observed. Um, in relation to the issues raised with levels, um, I have checked the, all the levels as they're sh from, from the way they're shown on the survey plan and then correlated that to the elevation plans we have. So I'm comfortable that the survey plans shown, the points of level shown on the survey plans have been accurately um, reflected in the rest of the drawings. Um, in relation to the car parking, um, that is an existing situation. So the existing width as shown on the plans is I think 2.3 metres, which if you're applying for a car space for a new dwelling, would not be acceptable. However, there is actually no ability for us to consider car parking under clause 5206 for an extension to an existing dwelling. So the existing car parking configuration can continue to be used and relied on and we can't um, require that to be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Powell. Right. So Councilor there was a, just a couple of others. Councillor Voss. Point. If I could, just the window shape and also the shadow diagrams, if you could comment on those two, please. Ms Powell. Um, through you, Mr Chair, in relation to the window shape, I understand the survey plans, I think, because they're taken at multiple points, in some instances it looks like they don't show the windows, but they are shown on other elevations. So um, it is a bit confusing, um, but I think it is a f it's come about because there have been a lot of um, uh, diagrams taken at different points. And again, that was part of the reason for undertaking a site visit to the back of the property and inside the property to ensure that we had the correct information. And I apologise because I forgot the second part of your question. Thank you. So through you, Mr Chair, in relation to shadowing, as a result of the consultation meeting, the applicant agreed to provide some additional shadowing plans. The first set of plans um, were correct. However, they hadn't um, gone into a great amount of detail in relation to the extent of shadowing and in terms of square meterage and percentages. So the second set of shadow diagrams which form attachment to um, provide the additional detail to make it um, um, a clearer to parties to understand the way that the shadowing would work. There would be some additional shadowing in the morning and afternoon to the two adjoining properties at 21 and 27. However, because they're large rear yards, the standard under course 54 would be met. But in, in terms of the accuracy, again, I'm satisfied that they are accurate. Thank you. Councillor Gross, I think you had your hand up earlier. Ten. There's been some debate about that, but you're satisfied that about two things, are you? That A, the plans are rendered correctly and not, I don't know if you saw some of the objectors' plans, but they moved the A10 line in and um, that even with the um, applicants' plans there was some uh, slight uh, um, variation from the res code standard. You're satisfied on both of those issues? Yes, so in relation to, um, through you, Mr Chair, um, setback standard, in order for us to be comfortable that the standard will be, that the objective is met and that we can therefore vary the standard, there, there are really two things that we will turn our mind to under the planning scheme. And the first is in relation to character. And the second is really the off-site amenity impacts from the variation. So there's two things we turn our mind to. Um, in this case, we're satisfied on both counts. Um, in terms of if there is some change in levels that would result in, say, an additional three to 400 millimetres, um, in terms of what that would mean for non-compliance, I believe it would still mean that the, um, the top level, a bit more of the top level would not comply. In terms of would that mean that the objective is met in terms of both character and off-site amenity impacts, I'm still satisfied that both would be met. Um, 
particularly, I think, uh, in relation to the scale of the development from a character perspective, which is shown in that rear elevation we were looking at earlier, which shows how the, um, the scale of the development relates to what's around it. Um, and in relation to off-site amenity impacts, I'm comfortable that all the off-site amenity impact standards would still be met in terms of overshadowing daylight to window solar access. And, and one, just last one, a bit of a quirky question. You talked about the um, uh, house next door, it's got a roof on it. Can you recall whether it's hip or gable? Through you, Mr Chair, is this to the east, number 27? 27, to the east. It's hip, is it? It is. It's definitely. It's definitely not flat. Um, I'm just trying to recall. Say so through you, Mr. Chairman, the plans at TP14 do depict a, a hip roof at the back. Councillor Crawford. There's a long list, sorry, Ms. Pound. Um, can I just ask the question about, is there any uh, need for an applicant to provide overshadowing to a yard that's quite a distance behind? Like, so the, the people to the south were saying that they requested, but I mean, from my reading of the shadow, it looks like it, there isn't much, and is there a requirement to provide that if there isn't? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, overshadowing under Res Code can only be assessed at the September equinox, which is the halfway point of the year. So for half of the year, the shadowing would in effect be less, and for half of the year, the shadow would be more. So it, it may be, and I can't say because I haven't seen any other diagrams, but that, for instance, in the summer, that the shadows are longer. So the winter, the shadows are longer. And so maybe at winter there might be some shadowing to the property to the rear. I can't say it, it's still over 13 metres away from the um, the the, re the rear of what's proposed. But there, maybe there could be. But regardless of that, we can't consider that under the planning assessment. We can only consider the shadow at the equinox. Councillor Crawford, have any further questions? Looking into his bedroom. On, I can't. I think it was on 27, the side of 27. I, I, I couldn't. Is that the case that uh, this one? It's still back to that steel screen. Um, what what requirement is there? Like distance between, like overlooking, and does it meet it? And do we need to screen it at all? Um, through you, Mr Chair, there were a couple of instances of non-compliance with the overlooking standard that have been picked up through the detailed assessment, which is outlined in the report, and that has resulted in recommended condition 1B on page 8 of the report, which requires some additional screening. Now, 1B1 re requires additional screening to the eastern side of the third floor balcony. So I believe that that relates to the area, the issue that was raised in relation to the adjoining bedroom. So that would require some additional screening and as you can see the condition is quite detailed in relation to the information we require. Councillor Crawford. And while we're overshadowing, just from the look of the uh, overhead there are quite substantial backyards between lower. So um, the people to the south were saying there's some overlooking into their children's bedrooms and bathrooms. Is It seems like it's quite a distance. Is there a minimum distance or any shading required there? So under clause 54 we're guided to consider a distance of nine metres from a habitable room window that's proposed to an existing private open space or habitable room window. So in this, dis in this instance as I said before the rear wall of what's proposed is over 13 metres away, which is why we haven't required some additional screening. Councillors, any other questions? Councillor Crawford? So could you explain to me if it's under a, 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 is it's under a neighbourhood residential code that, that only allows two storeys, why it can have three storeys. Is there something replacement thing uh, clause to consider? 
Thank you. So through you, Mr Chair, at clause 320910 of the Neighbourhood Residential Zone, there is a mandatory maximum building height for a dwelling or residential building in the Neighbourhood Residential Zone. So um, it's not varied in Schedule 5, which applies to this site, which means that the building height must not exceed nine metres and it must not contain more than two storeys at any point. However, the same clause goes on to outline a number of exceptions to these mandatory requirements some of which apply in this case. In particular, there's an exception um, for an extension to an existing building um, that does not exceed the building height of the existing building or contain a greater number of storeys than the existing building. So in this case, we're satisfied that it is an existing three-storey building or the rear component, and therefore that allows three storeys in this case. There's an additional exemption which allows um, the maximum building height to be exceeded by up to one metre above the slope of natural ground level where there is a certain slope of 2.5 degrees. So we're satisfied because this is a slope site that that exemption also applies, which instead of meaning that there's a nine metre maximum, there is a 10 metre maximum allowed. In, so there are two exceptions that apply in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. No further questions. Councillor Brand. A lot of my questions have been asked and answered, which is good. Um, I just wanted to um, just confirm um, the, the open garden space rule. It's not one that I'm very familiar with. And I just want to know how it, how, how it, what it's based on and just confirm that even if the lot was a single lot, that it would still conform. Ms Powell? Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. The mandatory garden area requirement sits under the Neighbourhood Residential Zone. It's a relatively recent addition to the planning scheme. It came in in 2018, so it is relatively recent. And what it requires is that when your lot is over a certain size, over 400 square metres, that you provide a certain percentage of garden area, essentially where there are no buildings constructed and it allows you to have planting. Um, now, there has been some discussion tonight about the technical aspects of this proposal because it comprises two lots. Technically, both of those lots are under 400 square metres and therefore the mandatory garden area does not require, uh, does not apply. Sorry. Um, however, as we've put in the officer report, the, if, even if it were to, comply, were to apply, which requires... Um, it would require, sorry, I apologise, I'll just go to the section in the report. So for a lot of 623 square metres, 623 square metres, sorry, which is the combined size of this lot, then is a minimum requirement for 30% or 187 square metres. So as calculated by the officers, we've determined that there's at least 219 square metres of garden area. So um, we're certainly in excess of that requirement. Councillor Brand. Um, I would also just, I just wanted to re-question um, the distance from the windows, uh, the, the upper floor windows of the proposal to the window lines of the house at 184 Alma Road. How, it's, it seems, how far, can you tell me how far the, the proposed building here, the window lines of the proposal is from the, from the, the rear fence of the block? And then how much, how, how far it is from the rear fence to the, to the neighbours, the back neighbours windows? Um, through you, Mr Chair. Unfortunately, I, can, I don't have the measurement from the back fence to the rear windows of 184. It's not shown on the plans, but I can, I can only give you the measurement from the back of what's proposed to the fence, which yes. is a um, minimum of 13.5 metres. Oh, so that's to the rear so fence? So that's just to the fence. So the distance then going on to the... Um, the windows of the adjoining okay. property. I can't tell you, but we're okay. No, that's why I, I thought. I thought that you said originally that it was 13 metres to the to the neighbour's house. It's actually 13 metres to the rear fence, and then it's another 10 metres or something like that to the, or maybe less. I don't know what that white part is, but it's so it is. It is. You'd say it was more than 20 metres from the from the neighbouring house. 
Councillor Brand, any further questions? Yes. Um, I want to. <laughs> well, I just want to. I want to ask what What do we know of the habitable rooms? Um, beside the building, beside the proposal at number 27 in that rear part, in that rear side of the wall. Apparently there is a bedroom, anecdotally, which we've heard all about. Um, I'm worried about those habitable rooms, um, in, in particular regard to not so much the view line, because I think that's, it seems quite acceptable that we, a building would be built beside their building, but the, um, the plant. The, the services plant. We have a we have a um, a screen which will visually screen the plant, but not acoustically screen the plant. And I'm just wondering whether that's a suitable place. It's about four and a half metres away from what is probably a habitable room bedroom, and four and a half metres doesn't seem very much of a a distance from a uh, from services plant and what have you. Miss Pound. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, from again, from the officer perspective, the screening would assist, allay some noise, um, and there's only a limited amount to which we can control noise-related issues here because the dwelling is an as-of-right use, and there is separate legislation under the EPA noise guidelines which relate to. Um, mechanical noise and also use of noise associated with the dwelling. So it's separate legislation. Um, we, under planning, we really foc for, for heritage matter, we're really focused on how it would appear. Councillor Brand, any further questions? So, so you have, we have no power to actually recommend that it might be moved or, or, or better shielded or anything like that? Um, well, not really, because we don't. We we can't control the noise. Of course, we can put the question to the applicant, and it could be dealt with through a condition if they are amenable to that. Councillor Brand, any further questions? No. Any other, Councillor Crawford? Can you just clarify for me, please, Miss Pound? It's hard to tell from all the images that we do have, but I know it's bulkier. But the extension is it's not higher than the extension the next door give it because of the grading of the land, is that correct? Uh, so yeah. in twenty seven I'm referring to. Yes, yeah, so through you, Mr Chair, that's correct. Um, and it's something that I think I appreciated most when I was standing in the backyard because it's very hard to appreciate levels from looking at the plans. Um, but yes, and that is what's demonstrated on that rear elevation plan is that it it, it is high number 27 is higher and, and that's partly because it, it, the block is higher. It's also partly because on this site they are doing a little bit of excavation so that there is a bit of sitting down of that lower floor as well. So there's a few things here as well as um, the flat roof form compared to the, the pitch that's next door. Thank you, Ms Pound. Councillors, any Councillor Brand? If, if we were so inclined to um Focus on the on the the effect of the plant, re, reasonably close to the uh, to a habitable room, neighbouring room. Is there is there some simple condition that we could put on now that would say to council's satisfaction or to just some way to give it a little bit of um, negotiation room that council that council officers could agree to after the fact tonight. Through you, Mr Chair, yes, we could certainly put an additional condition at condition one. So that could be condition um, 1C to require that the um, plant equipment, or if you're specifically concerned with the air conditioning unit, that the air conditioning unit be relocated away from any adjoining habitable room windows and specifically mention the habitable room windows there. I'm not sure that it warrants being moved away. I just want, to, I want an assessment done and a negotiation happen that it could either be relocated or, re, or better acoustically baffled or, or that everybody is happy that it's actually not going to be a problem, but to, to your satisfaction in some way. 
Um, Mr. Ball, did you have something to add to that? Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think a better condition would be uh, relocating it to a position to the satisfaction of council. Uh, that could be done through a negotiation with the um, the applicant at that point. And and if I could just um, add as well, in terms of the EPA guidelines, there are prohibited times for residential noise, and um, in, and noise can, shouldn't or cannot be heard from a habitable room um, after 11 p.m. and before 7 a.m. Monday to Friday, and weekends before 9 a.m. and after 11 p.m. So that will help protect the residents' amenity. Councillors, are there any further questions? No. Uh, Councillors, we have a recommendation from the officer before us. Do I have a mover for that or an alternate recommendation? Councillor Copsey, do I have a seconder? Councillor Voss, Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak? Councillor Voss, would you like to speak? No, I'll reserve my right. No. Any other councillor like to speak? Councillor Brand? Uh, so if you go ahead and read your amendment. It would be a good idea. It would be to add the condition 1C that um, plant. Um, Mr. Ball, could you just help Councillor yes. Brand with some wording here? Look, I think it'd be easier to combine all the services away and relocate them. I think that would be a much easier condition to prepare. So I've said, uh, written something here just as I was listening to say something like the relocation of all plant and services away from habitable room windows. Condition one already requires it to be to the satisfaction of council. So we don't need to add that in. Did you get all that? <laughs> If you could just repeat that uh, yes. slowly, Mr Borg, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, condition 1C could be added to read um, the relocation of all plant and services away from habitable room windows. I would say, I want to say plant because it might be a completely silent plant and I wouldn't need to be, uh, any, I would just say relocation of plant to council satisfaction. Through you, Mr Chairman, it is... Um, your motion, Councillor Brand. So, we'll go with that. That's what that's that's what I would. Councillor do. Brand, if you could read your motion. That the that uh, the reloc. I can't see how it works grammatically. But that the re the, no, that, the, that's redundant. the relocation of plant and services to. And now I've forgotten what Mr. Borg has said. Of course. To the satisfaction of council. Well, the whole yeah. thing is to sat council satisfaction. Yeah, the... Mr. Ball, could you just read just read out what you had and okay. drop the all? Um, my my um, just uh, my drafting would have said the relocation of all plant and services away from habitable room windows. Away from habitable room windows. Yeah. And that, through you, Mr. Chair, that provides just some opportunity to negotiate with the... Um, Can I say all yeah. noise emitting services? Or I mean, I just think it's... It might be something else that doesn't cause noise. Yeah. All right. I'll second that. Is that an acceptable amendment, Councillor Brand? You are... I'm trying to take the word all out, except I would bow to Mr Borg's uh, advice if it was a really terrible mistake, but... It... Are you now satisfied with that wording, Councillor Brand? Yes. Do we have a seconder for that, Councillor Gross? Anyone like, Councillor, like to speak to this motion? This amendment, sorry. I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? That is carried. We're back to the substantial motion with the amendment included. Uh, Councillor Copsey and Councillor Voss, Councillor, have spoken or passed their right to speak. Any other Councillor wish to speak? Councillor Crawford. I'm going to do a Councillor Brown at the moment. I'm still on the fence. Um, but I did want to express that... Yeah, I know. I don't usually sit on the fence. Uh, I just wanted to thank you everyone for coming. And I know that change is really hard and that it seems like a big extension. However, we are bound by the rules of planning in this instance and in many of these instances. 
Uh, the heritage is in the public realm. It doesn't refer to behind and it meets all the requirements that it seems to need to do in order to go ahead. So um, I haven't decided exactly how I'm voting, but I just wanted to express that we are bound by the, the, um, the rules of planning. Um, and my only hope is, whichever way it goes, that friends can be made of the neighbours because I think it's you know, a, a difficult start. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Nothing brings neighbours together like a planning application. Um, any other councillor wish to speak for or against? No, in that case, I will put the motion. All those in favour? I believe that, I believe that is carried. Thank you. All those against? I believe that is carried. Thank you. Item 6.2 is, and I've just lost my sheet of paper, where it went, oh sorry, under here. Uh, statutory planning delegation decisions, April 2019. Do I have any questions? No, Councillor Copsey would like to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Voss, Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak? Councillor Voss, would you like to speak? Would any other councillor wish to speak? That's a no. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? That is passed unanimously. Item 7, urgent business. Councillors, are there any items of urgent business? No. Item 8, confidential matters. Councillors, we have no confidential items tonight. There being no further business, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you, councillors.